Well, uh, first let me thank Joanne and Gabriel for uh, making this happen, and uh, especially Stefan for being born uh, six years ago. And uh, so um, let me, uh, before I start the talk, I, I want to explain how Stefan came into my life, and that was about 30, 35 years ago. And uh, so at the time, uh, I was uh, at the National Institute of Health, uh, working in the office of the chief with uh, Michael Unser. So who is the chief? The chief was Murray Eden. And uh, Murray uh, unfortunately died a few years, uh, few years ago, a couple years ago, a uh, couple weeks or uh, short of 100 years. So. Uh, so at the time, Mikael and I and uh, our chief were working on, on various problems, uh, sampling, uh, theory, splines, uh, we're doing pyramids, uh, we're trying to generalize sampling theory uh, to uh, bump functions and shifts, etc. And at some point, Ole Tretiak, who was a friend of uh, uh, Murray, came, uh, came to us and visited and he said, around the 1990, I believe, uh, and said, uh, have you read these papers uh, uh, by Stefan Malas? Well, we were very isolated. We had not, uh, we didn't really have a community. We were having a lot of fun doing all kind of research because Murray said, uh, you can do whatever you want. So we were, we were doing absolutely whatever we wanted. And uh, so, of course, everybody knows uh, these papers and suddenly this amazing, um, he pointed out to these absolutely beautiful paper, one in the transaction of the American Mathematical Society and the other one in the Atropolitan Transaction there. And uh, suddenly, a lot of the things that uh, we were doing seemed to, to, to have a framework, a beautiful framework. And uh, we could actually suddenly also uh, use this, this new uh, area and contribute. And, and we found a new community, which is uh, some, of, some of you are here, and it's really a wonderful community, and we, we ha have been very, very lucky. Uh, and again, uh, later, uh, I met Stefan in conferences, and a friendship uh, formed, and thank you, Stefan, for your friendship. So this is, this is a little bit how the story began. And of course, um, you know, sampling theory, wavelet theory, frame theory, they're all connected very well. Uh, I'm not going to go, well, I'll just explain a little bit the connection with frame today, uh, this particular uh, problem that I'll be talking about. Um, so, let me see, I want to go back. So dynamical sampling, I'll try to explain what this means. And, and frames, of course, uh, we'll know frames. And um, so let me start some motivation. Well, uh, some of this really was motivated by the work of Martin Betterly and Yu Lu, uh, and also John Murray Bruce uh, and Pierre-Louis de Rigotti and other of, uh, of uh, Martin's collaborator uh, uh, on this subject. And, uh, I could tell you a little story. So we, we were reading a, an old paper by uh, uh, Martin, a, a, conf, uh, a conference paper, and we just couldn't quite understand it. Uh, I couldn't, and so I gave it to my student. This is what you do when you don't understand something. <laughs> and uh, so uh, after a while, we decided, OK, let's, let's kind of try to, to formulate uh, the, the problem. So some of what I will show here is really uh, uh, well, I'll try to give you a bunch of problems. But before I go on, uh, we have worked. Uh, I've worked with a lot of people, a lot of collaborators, and a lot of this work. Uh, some of it is that I'll present here is, of course, in collaboration with some of my students, uh, some of my collaborators and friends, and uh, postdocs. So here's some names. I hope I didn't forget anybody, but uh, uh, so you probably know a few here from this list. So let me, uh, let me go and just explain a little bit uh, what dynamical sampling is. So of course, the classical sampling, uh, Shannon, you have a band-limited function, you sample it at the right rate, and you reconstruct it. 
that's the simplest version of it. But now we have uh, a function, uh, which an initial distribution, uh, which is acted upon by some operator or family of operator that uh, change the initial uh, in th that change initial distribution in time, and this is f at time t. And essentially, you could uh, sample uh, the function f and some spatial the initial distribution and on some some set spatial set omega naught. And after uh, it have been acted upon by an operator at time t1, you sample uh, f at time t1 uh, on a on a different, possi on a possibly different uh, s uh, spatial set, etc., and you have possibly uh, coarse sampling taken at various times, uh, and you want to find conditions on the operator, on the sampling sets, etc., to that uh, uh, to be able to recover f. And of course, once you do that, you can recover all uh, next uh, distribution. So uh, let me go to the next. So. So what is dynamical sampling? It's really a set of problems, uh, many of them. So one way to, to describe them is you have uh, an, uh, an abstract initial value problem. So that could be the heat equation. So we have d, du dt is equal to uh, au uh, plus f. f is some uh, n eta. So, so a is just some generator of a semigroup. Uh, eta is some background, this is how we think about it. Uh, F uh, could be uh, the, the relevant uh, source that's driving the system, and U0 is uh, the initial condition. So this is the general setting in some way that, to, to think about some of these problems. Uh, and depending on what you know and what you don't know, uh, you have different type of problems and, 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 and to, to, that you can think about. And uh, so we have names for them, uh, uh, time-space trade-off in sampling. So in this case, we assume that f and eta are zero uh, or known, uh, and uh, the operator is known. And we want to sample uh, the, um, the solution u at uh, some spatial and time samples. And we would like to recover, uh, say, u0. Uh, and then, of course, u at any, any given point from these samples. Uh, system identification, uh, possibly, for example, you have f eta is uh, are, are zero or known, and uh, you want to recover uh, maybe the operator A and possibly uh, the initial uh, uh, distribution. Uh, or you could have uh, problems in which you have, uh, uh, you want to, re you know something about the operator, and you don't know the, you know some something about the the the, the background, and you want to recover uh, this source. And I don't know how much time I will have to 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 to, to talk, but I'll just uh, stop whenever I need to stop. <laughs> it's only like uh, you know. Talk. Yeah, exactly. So let's let me start with an example. So suppose. I'm in L2 of z, uh, so this is a space-time trade-off. For example, you have an initial distribution. This is the function f, and uh, these little uh, uh, dots, uh, the red and uh, the, the black dot, uh, say, think of them as z, and the red dot is where we sample. Of course, if I sample f at these red dots, and I want to know f on, on, this, uh, on all the dots in this first level, that's not possible, but uh, if you have, if you know the operator and the operator is 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 evolving f, a uh, f is time one. We sample there a square, etc., and we sample at these red spots. And the question is, given these uh, space-time sampling, uh, can we recover f? Um, so that would be an example of a, sp a space-time trade-off or space-time because. Basically, you want, in general, um, a sampling device are expensive, so you, 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 you want to use them uh, to discover something. But, uh, so you want to have a few, but, and, but you can repeat, uh, repeating, uh, repeat them in time, sampling in time. So this is, this is a space-time trade-off. 
And let me simply, uh, so I'm, this is really more to, to set up the, the, uh, the notation. So, uh, so here uh, we have a Hilbert space. We have a set of the Hilbert space uh, G, which is a countable set. Tau is subset of R, uh, and uh, and I'm going and you have uh, you act a to the power t on all the uh, these vector uh, j in, in j and t in tau, and uh, then uh, depending on which situation you are, you can talk about uh, a semi-continuous frame. This is, the, if you have these two conditions, so here t uh, could vary uh, on an interval, for example, or if, if the measure is discrete, you can have the, just the usual definition of frames, uh, the Riesz basis. So essentially, we're going to think about a to the power tj applied to uh, j at, as, as, as these objects that we're going to look at and uh, we'll see how this uh, relate to, to our problems. Uh, so let me, let me start again uh, to talk about the sampling problem and to kind of, uh, I have an operator A, it's a bounded operator on Hilbert space. I have a subset, a discrete, uh, well, sorry, a countable subset of Hilbert space H. And the measurements are, uh, so the sampling, you act, this is the inner product, if you like, uh, you take the inner product of j with a to the power t f, t belongs to this sampling, uh, time sampling set, and j are the spatial sampling set. And those are our measurements. And the question then is, uh, can we recover f from these measurements? Of course, we want to recover f uh, in a stable way. This is the, the, the space-time uh, trade-off. Uh, and uh, so if you take this operator and you put it on the other side of the inner product, that become A star. And then this problem of recovering uh, F from the space-time sample becoming really, just in a stable way, become really a problem on frames. This is exactly saying, is A star T, J, where J runs through this set and T runs through this set, is that a frame for H? That's the, that's the problem, really. If we know, understand this, then we know exactly if our sampling set is a good sampling set or not. So it's completely now a problem of frames, and we can think about uh, trying to understand when do we have frames uh, of this sort. So now I'm going to uh, forget the star. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to talk always about a to the power tj. OK, so, uh, so we want to find, for example, condition on these objects here, the set j, tau, and the operator a, so that this is a frame. And unfortunately, when we started doing this, it seems like everything is a negative, like negative results. So the first thing that we started so uh, is that if you take A to be a normal operator, which is about what you, uh, and, and you have a countable set here, and you take uh, the time to be, say, the integer, positive integer, and you, so you iterate A uh, and you apply it to J on the set, and that can never be a basis. So not reach basis, just forget about it. So that was the first result. So oh, this is not very good. And then we say, OK, that's probably because maybe uh, you know, there is something that's, uh, uh, maybe we should normalize and have everything one, and et cetera. So, uh, so then we said, OK, well, if we normalize this, so now we have things that have norm one. Maybe the thing that is going wrong here, things are just blowing up. We, we <laughs> We decided to look at that, and then suddenly, and we took A to be self-adjoint, and, and, and that was not, not a frame. It's not, it's not possible to have a frame uh, either, like at least if we normalize. And then uh, that's the first problem that we actually left uh, open and uh, for, for some students if they want to look at that. So uh, can you actually uh, uh, go beyond that? And so if, if it's normal, it's the same. Uh, true. So we believe it's true, but we don't know. So, uh, so uh, of course, everything relies on normal operators. So if you go beyond normal operator, then things work. For example, if you if you take the Hilbert space to, to be L2 of n, and s is a shift, and you can take a single 
a vector, the 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, apply the shift to the right, and you get an orthonormal basis. You know, that's not a problem. So normal, the normal actually kind of really gets you, but those are actually the good, the good operator, the normal one, the one that may come from physics. Finally, uh, we started thinking about a problem which seems like impossible. So, 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 and in fact, for a while, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, my collaborator, Carlos and Ursula, and my student, uh, Soi Tang, uh, we started to believe that just, we should just stop and uh, call it a day. <laughs> and uh, so here, what we wanted to do is we had a, 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 a bounded operator, and we wanted to, and we have a Hilbert space of infinite dimension, and we asked the following question, can we actually form a frame by applying to a single vector. So, so it's kind of a bit crazy because you say, um, so I want to measure the temperature uh, at, at uh, initial temperature in this room, but I'm going to sample only at one place. Of course, for the, for the heat operator, it's not possible. We know that. But, but, uh, uh, but for a normal operator, uh, can, we, can we, just by sampling at spatial at only a single, single place, can we recover? Uh, can we have a frame? Uh, can we, can we, apply a to the power n on a single vector g and get a frame. And it turns out actually it's possible, which kind of go against everything we've done before because we thought, uh, yeah, okay, so we are totally screwed. And we, we, we were working very, very hard uh, to get the condition of not, or we were not sure. And uh, thank God, uh, Jorge and Tesana uh, had a, uh, told us about uh, some work by Carlson and, and we needed a condition that actually will finally uh, got us there. And we could make finally a frame <laughs> out of iteration of, of, of a single vector. And suddenly we thought, ah, okay, so now this is a good news. Maybe we can, do for, we can go further. Uh, uh, so what are the co condition, of course? So uh, for this one, uh, the operator have to be essentially uh, sum of rank one. Or, or Think of it as just a diagonal matrix with non-repeating eigenvalues. Uh, uh, and they have to be strictly less than one. They have to converge to one. They have to have a, this, uh, this condition, which is related to uh, some uh, H, H2. And you can construct then uh, vectors that will make uh, this iteration uh, uh, a frame. So that's, that's the first example that we could, we could uh, understand and create. And, and then we were able to, to, to generalize this, but to obtain um, a necessary condition uh, for, for A and J. Now J now is a finite set instead of just one vector. Uh, can we get a frame? Then uh, essentially it's the same, almost the same condition, but the rank, the rank of the PJ of, of these projections uh, are less than equal uh, uh, to J. Uh, so, well, we couldn't get the, uh, the uh, Amenak Petrosian is uh, one of my former students, and uh, we, we, we stopped there. We did not find the, the sufficient condition, but finally, uh, uh, this uh, set of uh, researchers uh, uh, were able to, to nail it down to, to find a uh, necessary and sufficient condition. And, and so now this is, this is, so we understand how these things work. Um, so talking about, uh, uh, we, can, we can now talk about let t be, be in some interval. Uh, and, and there we also now understand that uh, uh, this is where you, your, your time sampling is continuous uh, over an interval. And uh, here are some results that uh, actually kind of at the beginning were surprising to us. Says uh, uh, continue uh, uh, under under some condition on the operator A. Uh, uh, actually, here just bounded. Uh, if uh, uh, for this to be a semi-continuous frame, uh, when you when you um, the time sampling is over an interval, it's equivalent as to to so there must there must be some some times that are discrete and finite that will allow you to create that frame, not just from continuous uh, measurement. So continuous measurement doesn't gain you too much because you can do it with discrete in some sense. You may not know exactly 
uh, where we know, for example, have to be sufficiently small. Uh, the converse uh, was a little bit uh, uh, needed extra condition. A had to be invertible, and for that case, this is an if and only if condition. So discrete and continuous were equivalent. Uh, so let me go and uh, there is a beautiful uh, 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 paper by Freeman and, uh, and Spiegel uh, that actually give the most general condition on when you can go from a discrete uh, frame uh, to, to a semi-continuous frame. And this uh, appeared also about the same time we had. Uh, there, uh, they, it's a little bit more general, but we have a little bit, um, we're less general, but we have more, more, a little bit stronger, stronger results. But, but anyway, this is a beautiful paper that kind of go back and forth between these two. Uh, another thing about this that surprised us, so suppose you, you at the time uh, interval in which you are computing your, uh, your sampling, uh, is say between zero and one. If you go below zero and one, zero and a half, is that, do you get a frame? Well, if you go, at, if you if you if you get a frame by going by sampling between zero and one, l equal to one, you go beyond that. Well, you obviously have a frame, or or you think you have a frame. Uh, but but sampling less, if you have a frame, by sampling on an interval zero one. Can you sample on, uh, what happens if you sample on the interval zero half? Well, you have a frame. It doesn't matter. So you, no matter how small, if you get one interval, you get all, all, all intervals. So this was surprising to us. Uh, so this was, however, for, uh, we did this for the self-adjoint operator. Again, uh, we don't know about normal operators. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay. So I'll talk a little bit then uh, about uh, this problem. This is also, uh, so this is more the source identification. So we want to know F. And uh, so again, we have, we have an operator A that's generated a semigroup, a C0 semigroup. And we have a source and, uh, that we want to know, F. Uh, we have a background. Uh, eta, which we don't know, but we know a little bit something about it. And uh, we want to sample in space and time, or if you want, we want functional, so we want to set j, and uh, sampling time tau, so that we eventually recover f. And f is simply a bunch of uh, uh, Dirac in time and some function multiplying these Dirac, and these functions are the Hilbert space uh, f of j. So, um, my collaborator, Ilya, I like to, to have a visual thing of thinking about this particular problem here. He says, well, suppose you, you have uh, a little, uh, you're in the ocean, you have, you have waves, and, but they are kind of going around. And so this is the eta, you don't know, but you know it's, it's kind of going somewhat uh, uh, slowly. And then you have these, uh, these functions that, uh, so those are little fish that, uh, that kind of jump. And so they form little waves. And, and you have these devices bobbing onto the sea recording uh, some, you know, some things. And the question is from these uh, uh, devices, can you, recording devices that are going, can you actually figure out when these fish jump and where? And that's, that's really essentially what, what this problem. I, I like this, uh, this is, he likes fish. So, um, so of course uh, we, we have you know you can you can take this as this and we have other other uh, options and more general things but this is this is the idea so here uh, for this what I'm going to show you is just that uh, you you don't know these time you don't know these guys that belong to some subspace of H so I'm going to think of it as all of H let's not uh, worry about that and uh, we know something about eta. So what do we know about eta? It's it's um, um, it's Lipschitz. It has it kind of vary with a Lipsch, uh, Lipschitz, and moreover, uh, with some Lipschitz constant m. Uh, moreover, what we know is that uh, no, normally when we measure, so uh, well, let me first tell you what the problem is. So 
We want to basically design or find condition or design in this case. A subset of sampler or sa uh, sampling design, if you like, a subset of vectors in H, and a time, uh, uh, a sampling time beta uh, that allow us to, stab to recover stably this F or approximate it uh, from noisy measurements. So the measurement, we, we are basically sampling uh, our, op, our, our, our u on n beta, n is the time, beta is, so we're sampling uniformly, uh, j is our functionals, uh, eta is some noise. So we, this is what we get, this is our, our measurement. We want to, from this measurement, or from, we want to design this vector and find the beta such that this will allow to essentially uh, uh, recover f in some good way and get estimates on how well we are discovering. Eta is our background and it, uh, it have a, it, it's a source background. It's and uh, Lipschitz constant m and the, 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 every time we measure, we have a little uh, noise and we're assuming this, uh, this condition. Uh, so we actually, thought about a couple algorithm. I'm going to tell you one. Really at the end it's simple. Uh, it took us a while but it's simple. <laughs> so so um, here is what we want to do. We want to, f we, we pick a frame for the Hilbert space H and we add to it another frame or another set which depends on our operator. So we know our op operator, so we know, we know the, 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 uh, the semi-group. So we take T star at beta, so the, the time sample, uh, and we apply to, to the original set that we chose, and, that, and we take the union of these, and that's our set J. So with this set J, uh, we uh, will allow us to recover. Uh, if beta is sufficiently small, and we will uh, we'll explain that. So why this union? So here's the idea, and I'm gonna tell you, it's, it's very simple at the end. So uh, J consists of two of, of vectors from here and from here. So every time, I'm gonna pick a vector from here and the corresponding vector from here. So at time n, I make uh, this measurement and this measurement. This measurement is really a prediction of what will happen at time n plus one, if there is a fish that jump. Uh, and so if there is a fish that jump, the difference of between these measurements should, should be something, should be large. And if there is no fish, our prediction and, 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 and the next measurement, u of tn plus one j and this uh, should, should be essentially zero up to so this is the idea, really. So, so uh, the measurement at time n using this, this vector here, and the measurement at time n plus 1 using this guy, they should be essentially 0 if there is no burst in this interval. Otherwise, we should detect something. And this is the picture that I drew on. Uh, so now I could probably use chat GPT to make a better picture. <laughs> but uh, this is the best thing I, I, I could come up with with, you know. Um, and uh, I will just give you uh, the result I, uh, of what we can do with that. Um, so with this algorithm, if beta is sufficiently small, we can essentially detect uh, both the time of the, the times of the, of the jumping fish when they jumped and, and an approximation of, of the vector fj in the Herbert space. Uh, so this is what we had, this is what we get, and the difference between, between these two depends, of course, on uh, the sampling interval, beta. Uh, here you have the uh, Lipschitz constant, that's uh, uh, the, the wave that are large, so, so, so the, the C is pretty calm. <laughs> yes, and, and this is the sigma, uh, so the, the error, uh, the noise that we, we, we get when we, when we sample. And, and this is some, 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 some term 
that will go to zero as, as beta tend to zero. So I'm going to stop here. And there is another uh, method uh, that, uh, what happened here? OK. So Stefan, uh, thank you for being a friend. And thank you uh, for all, all the things that you have done for this community. Uh, so bon anniversaire. And uh, uh, Jonah and uh, uh, Gabriel, uh, it is really a wonderful uh, meeting. I, seen again some old friends and I met uh, new friends. This is a very friendly and wonderful uh, 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 community. So uh, I propose maybe you can do one every year. Uh, so yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time for one quick question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Very nice talk. Do you have any, any thought or any hope of uh, having something like this when there's no commutative property, when there's not the semi-group, but the, like the generator does not commute? <laughs> uh, I say I don't know. Uh, some of these new, uh, so you're talking about the, the source problem. So some of these are really recent stuff that we have been looking at. Um, I, I don't know how to answer, answer this question, but maybe we can talk and you can tell me more, more explicitly what you have in mind. Yeah. Relevant, yes. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Have you thought about, so, so, okay, time goes on, you learn a little bit about the thing and you'd like to know where should, when should I sample next, like more adaptive. Right, 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 right. So this is a very good problem. Maybe you make a model even of what you're looking for and you say, now that I've seen this much, I've learned this much, this is where so I would like to sample. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very good question. And uh, uh, we have actually uh, uh, started thinking about some of these problems and describing where do we want to sample. In fact, we have some of these problems on graphs. And the question is where we sample uh, in time and, and space uh, to be optimal in some sense. Um, it's very hard problems, very, very hard problems. Uh, we have some algorithms uh, that we, we looked at that seem to give some reasonable answer, but we have absolutely no idea how to prove any, so far anything about them. Uh, so yeah, that's all I can say. They're very hard problems right now, at least from this, this time, yeah. Thank you, Dr.